Greetings of peace. I am Lourdes Pachesha Tolentino Morales, your resource speaker for this talk. I am a licensed professional teacher and currently a school administrator in a private basic education institution here in General Santo City. Please allow me to share my screen so we can begin the presentation. Welcome to Authentic Assessment in Fundamentals of Peace Education 101 for Mindanao State University in General Santo City. Um, this presentation is divided into two parts. So this is part one. As we begin, please open first the Google form, the talk engagement form that was sent with this recording. So the link is here, but I believe that you were able to receive the link also. Questions or instructions will be asked along the way. Please supply your answers in the form. You may pause the recording if you need to. So please open that. Thank you. In the form, you're going to find the same questions posted here on our slide. Okay, let's begin. For the first one, we'd like to know first, what three words or terms can you associate with authentic assessment? Please supply your answers in the talk engagement form. I think you're done. And for the second question, before we begin the talk proper, in a scale of one to five, five being the highest, how would you rate your knowledge on the concept of authentic assessment? Thank you. So just hold your form because there's going to be another or other questions along the way. So for this talk, we are going to answer four main questions. And the first three questions will be part of this part one of the talk. First question, of course, what is authentic assessment? The second question, why use authentic assessment? Why is this even part of your training. The third one, how is it different from traditional assessment? And the last one, which will be part of part two, how is it done? So that somehow gives you a clue that it's going to be a long one, a relatively long one, because it's going to involve a process. So let us uh, convert the questions into objectives, um, into statements of objectives. So these are what you should be able to do after this session. The first one, define authentic assessment. Second one, explain the reasons for the use of authentic assessment. Third, differentiate authentic assessment from traditional assessment. And fourth, design authentic assessment tasks and tools for FPE 101 students. Because ultimately and eventually, that is what this training is going to be for. Okay. But first, we need to establish our assumptions because we are not going to cover these points anymore, but it's worth considering and it's worth reviewing what these are. We have three assumptions. The first one, we understand the types of assessment and the purpose of each, right? There are, there are six types of assessment and we're going to uh, recall and consider only three because um, in the talk, there might be references to them. So we should know 
that there's diagnostic assessment, there's formative assessment, and there is also summative assessment. When we know them, we will appreciate better the concepts presented in this talk or in this presentation. The second assumption, we understand that curriculum assessment and instruction should be aligned and congruent. This is the reason why you mapped the learning outcomes first and even analyzed them, indicated specifically the cognitive learning outcomes, social-emotional learning outcomes, and the behavioral learning outcomes. And this is the reason why you have the syllabus. Carefully studied, carefully mapped out, and I believe is already available. Okay, so this is a, an actual portion of the file that you have for FPE 101. So for the purpose of the terms used in the presentation, we are going to use the term curriculum to refer to the basis of what you intend to teach. So in the case or in the context of of Mindanao State University for FPE 101, you call this the course learning outcomes. And in the copy of the syllabus, there are um, six, seven learning outcomes specified. So uh, you have in your syllabus that at the end of the course, students should be able to Number one, demonstrate understanding of the concept of peace and culture of peace. Number two, demonstrate awareness on the different approaches to resolve conflict. Number three, show ability to select and use appropriate method of resolving conflict. Number four, reflect on the similarities of the different religions of the world and their significance to peace building. Number five, Demonstrate awareness on the healing and reconciliation as both a process and a goal. Number six, show ability to design, develop, and implement peace project. And number seven, display attributes of peace-loving, change accelerators or agents of positive change, peace advocates or champions, and peace uh, and builders of a culture of peace. So. I need to, to, I need to present that and uh, lead you to this, uh, lead your attention to this one because this is going to be essential as we understand the role of authentic assessment in what you want to do in delivering FPE 101, okay? Um, other than those seven learning outcomes that are found or indicated in the copy of the syllabus, I also took this part to just highlight the terms and highlight uh, what, you, what you have currently. Okay, um, we are not sure if these are final, but these are what we have as of the moment. So this is the actual copy of the syllabus, a portion of it. I covered the contents of some parts because they're not really needed for this slide. And to make sure that we only see what we have to see, okay? But protecting intellectual property too. So we have... Um, Again, other than the seven learning outcomes that we read earlier, there is also another column here, okay, that is entitled learning outcomes. And some of them are different from the seven mentioned earlier. So uh, clarifications might be given in one of the venues that you will be given, but that is so far what we have seen, okay? So why is this important? Because later you are going to see what the role of learning outcomes 
is. Okay? Because it has its role in authentic assessment. So, this has to be brought up because this will help you determine what will be your anchor when you design your learning delivery plan. Okay, so we have here status significance of, F F of FPE 101 course offering of MSU system, which is a beautiful course. Differentiate positive piece from negative piece. Express in creative way their own definition of peace. So these are three learning outcomes indicated in this portion of the syllabus, course scope and learning plan. Okay, so these are our assumptions. Okay, so for assumption number two, ensuring alignment of curriculum, assessment, and instruction, let's have an example. Okay, so if in the curriculum or your syllabus, the learning outcome or your objective indicated is to differentiate positive piece from negative piece, in your instruction, in what you're going to teach and how you are going to teach, there should be learning experiences that will allow the students to differentiate positive piece from negative piece. Okay, I hope that is clear. And for the last one, which is assessment, usually the summative assessment, what we have towards the last phase of the learning process, the teaching process. So we have differentiate positive piece from negative piece. This is what we mean when we say that they have to be aligned and they have to be consistent. Okay? That's the second assumption. Let us not drop the learning outcomes that we intend to hit. Because most of the pitfalls of teachers, educators, is that when the learning experiences are designed, the, the plan gets derailed. There are so many sorts of activities given. And sometimes those activities are not aligned with what the teacher or the program or the course intends to help the student develop. So assumption number two is very important. And number three, our assumption is that you understand and embrace your role in making peace education and global citizenship transformative as this is cascaded from the university's vision mission and programs we are with the thought that those who are teaching fpe 101 see the bigger picture for this program and doesn't just see this as a subject that the students need to take okay the key goal of of fpe 101 is transformative education and we think that even for, for, other, for other subjects, we would like to, to make sure that we're creating impact in our community, that we are transforming the community. Okay, so there is transformative power in, in the programs that we design. Thus, the need for authentic assessment. So if something if something is aimed at creating impact, it has to be authentic and it has to, it has to include authentic components or authentic elements. Okay, so let's begin. Point number one or question number one, what is authentic assessment? Or we will refer to this as AA. We have two definitions, no? In, in the context of authentic assessment, there are two names that uh, experts refer to. They're what we call the gurus. So one of the simplest and one of the favorite definitions is the one by John Muller in 2013. 
According to him, authentic assessment is a form of assessment in which students are asked to perform real-world tasks that demonstrate meaningful application of knowledge and skills. And then there's another definition, and that is by Wiggins in 1993, see Grant Wiggins. According to him, authentic assessment refers to the engaging and worthy problems or questions of importance in which students must use knowledge to fashion performances effectively and creatively. The tasks are either replicas or analogous to the kinds of problems faced by adult citizens and consumers in the field. So we are already getting keywords here. Um, what's helpful about having a more specific definition is that it somehow clarifies the context of the concept. If you're going to have the chance to read the, the blogs published by Mr. Grant Wiggins, it would be very nice because you'll, you're going to see the evolution of the term. Um, in one of his blogs, he mentioned that the term was probably coined first back in 1989, as early as 1989, but it, it was not developed yet as authentic assessment. I think he used uh, real tests or authentic tests. And then uh, studies, were, studies were done and the concept was developed. Okay, so let us look at the keywords in this definition. They have to be engaging. Well, some tests are also engaging, right? They have to be worthy problems. Questions of importance. But more importantly, this is very noteworthy. Students must use knowledge to fashion performances effectively and creatively. There are qualifiers added in that definition. And one of the things that you probably mentioned too in your, in your engagement uh, form earlier, talk engagement form, when I asked you to, to give three words that you associate with, the, with authentic assessment, so we will see that um, tasks are replicas. They are they are like they are like the actual problems faced by adult citizens and faced by people in the field. So simulations, um, authentic scenarios, real life scenarios are some of the things that we associate with this. So those are the two definitions, the first one by John Mueller and the second one by Grant Wiggins. Okay, and then here are some other uh, notes that will help us understand more what authentic assessment is. Sometimes referred to also as performance-based assessment or alternative assessment. There's even another term, direct assessment. But we have to be careful because these terms are not entirely interchangeable. Okay, so because when we say performance-based, it might, it might suggest that only those that allow performance are considered authentic, not all the time also. And then, um, well, alternative assessment is a term used to refer also to authentic assessment. The second one, it usually includes the use of rubrics to evaluate the student's performance. Um, actually, most of the time, if not always, it is good practice for educators to use rubrics when evaluating the student's performance. And extra caution has to be considered when creating the rubrics. We are going to talk about that in the second part of this presentation or the talk. 
And then, uh, Grant Wiggins enumerated 27 characteristics. That's why along the way, you're going to see that it is a beautiful, a beautiful design. But again, caution needs to be considered when designing authentic assessment tasks. There are 27 characteristics. I, I think I included the link of uh, some of the helpful references if you want to know more about the 27 characteristics enumerated by Grant Wiggins for authentic assessment. This is an important note. If we are familiar with the revised Bloom's taxonomy, we are going to visualize how learning is able to elevate, how thinking gets elevated. And we can juxtapose the components, the levels of the revised Bloom's taxonomy to three things that at the bottom part of the taxonomy, the students show what they know. And they have to move from what they know, what they're able to tell us that they know. They, are, they should be able to move from knowledge level to what they can do with what they know. That is process. Can they, can they do something about what they know? Because if they can, then they're able to get to the next level, the higher level of thinking. And eventually, they are expected to create, right, at the top of the taxonomy. And what is that creation for, right? That is to eventually be able to make use of what they know to help build a better, a better community. So this is where there should be transformation and where education should be an agent or a channel of transformation. So this is one of the, one of the important roles of education in our community for the students to be able to move from what they know to what they can do with what they know and eventually to make use of what they know to help build a better community. So let's pause for now after our first question. It's your turn based on the two definitions, the first one being given by John Muller and the second one by Grant Wiggins. How would you define authentic assessment? Please go back to our talk engagement form and key in your response or responses. I'll just proceed. Please pause this recording if you have to. Question number two, why use authentic assessment? So again, our reference is the authentic assessment toolbox published by John Muller, which is found in this link. Okay, you can, you can have that because it's very helpful. Authentic assessment, according to him, are direct measures. Paper and pencil tests or the traditional tests, the traditional assessments, are considered indirect measures to see students' learning or to see students' achievement what the, what the student is able to learn from a particular topic or a particular uh, learning episode. Um, it is direct in the sense that if we ask the student to define, then the student should be able to define. If the student is supposed to, to demonstrate, then the student is supposed to demonstrate because it's mostly behavioral and demonstrative. That is why it's considered direct measure. 
for the second one, AA capture constructive nature of learning. Studies tell us that that information, that meaning is not fed to learners. Learners need to construct meaning through the, the, through the teaching learning process. The students are able to make meaning out of the, the contents that they learn. So in authentic assessment, there's a beautiful process of capturing how the learning takes place. For the third one, authentic assessment, integrate teaching, learning, and assessment. This is really where we see the teachers as facilitators. Initially, the teacher designs the task, carefully plans the, the process, but eventually it's going to be the student who will take much participation because the student will have to demonstrate learning by applying what he or she knows in creating something, usually a product or a performance. And that is why it's able to integrate teaching, learning, and assessment. And the last one, AA provide multiple paths to demonstration. This is one of the exciting things about using authentic assessments that we are able to exhaust different platforms. We're able to tap different uh, formats. We can actually scan the environment of the student. Um, even, even at the context of distance learning, these are still possible with, with virtual with virtual platforms, just like right now, uh, this is being done asynchronously and therefore we just have to make some adjustments in the format, but still we are able to achieve our target of training the teachers of FPE 101. So authentic assessment provide multiple paths to demonstration it also allows creativity of the student it taps on the strengths of the student because they can be given options and products and performances can actually be differentiated not like when when they are given traditional assessment when they simply respond to questions and they respond to items this one will allow them to tap on their creativity tap on their strengths so the purpose of authentic assessment is to provide students with ample opportunity to engage in authentic tasks real life tasks so as to develop use and extend their knowledge higher order thinking and other 21st century competencies the third question how is authentic assessment different from the traditional assessment for for some of you who's encountering authentic assessment for the first time or maybe you've heard this but have not really um, immersed in the concept then this is a big question for you how is AA different from traditional assessment? And then we're going to have an answer or answers to this. Okay, so briefly, uh, John Muller, again, uh, because he has published a lot of references for this one, um, but uh, briefly, briefly uh, stating all these. So he, he, this is from him traditional assessment and authentic assessment. So we're going to view this from this perspective. So this is one column and this is another column. Traditional assessment, students select a response. Okay, so teachers design the assessment tool in such a way where the students are going to select a response. So multiple choice items, true or false items, um, and other test types. But for authentic assessment, that does not exist. The students need to perform a task. 
For example, in physical education, if the if the competency is to dribble a ball, then the child has to show that he or she can dribble a ball. In ICT or in computer, if the child is expected to be able to use the tools in, in the office, then the child should be able to use the tools in the in MS office. Okay. And then, for example, if the child should be able to demonstrate the proper way of typing, then it has to be demonstrated. That is how um, different traditional assessment is from authentic assessment in terms of this first comparison. Second one, traditional assessment is considered as contrived. It is unnatural and usually feels like it's forced. But for authentic, especially if the teacher is able to design carefully the performance task, it's based on real life scenarios. For some, a, um, for some, the products are actually responses to, to actual problems that the students see. Okay, so we, we can we can actually associate that, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, project-based learning because that is authentic. Okay. In traditional assessment, there's much use of recall or recognition. But for authentic assessment, there's construction and application of learning. Meaning is constructed and learning is applied. So we see how high the level of thinking um, is tapped for authentic assessment. For traditional, it's teacher structured. For authentic, it is student structured. Although it is still teacher facilitated and teacher initiated, but much of the participation comes from the student. And traditional assessment is considered as an indirect evidence of learning. We can only infer, right? I'm sure you will agree that there are a lot of times when students are able to give the right response, probably to an essay based on what they believe should be given as an answer. But in reality, that is not how the student is behaving or that is not how the student is acting. But for, for authentic assessment, then it is considered a direct evidence because they have to demonstrate the skill. They have to demonstrate the learning. They have to demonstrate their understanding of the concept of, or the topic that was covered in class, not, not necessarily just taught by the teacher because that suggests um, a te teacher-centered approach. Okay, so these are the differences between authentic assessment and traditional assessment according to John Mueller. So there is this question, do we need to choose between the two? As educators, do we need to choose between the two? The answer is no. We are actually encouraged to use a combination of traditional assessment and um, authentic assessment. They both have their roles. In fact, this is already in place in basic education, in kinder to grade 12, not just in the Philippines, but um, the framework of uh, K to 12 has this a combination of the um, authentic assessment and traditional assessment. We still need to test how much the students have learned in terms of the concepts, right? But then we have to move towards higher order thinking skills for the students to be able to have opportunities to show what they're able to do with what they know. So it's best that we use traditional assessment for the knowledge level, for the maybe expression of their thoughts, of their insights, 
um, which can actually also be considered authentic, right? But for but for parts that are foundations of knowledge, the terms, the definitions, for them to be able to process information. Because without these, without the lower level of thinking, the higher levels of thinking will also have difficulty taking place. They will still be affected because there are no foundations. So yes, it is still encouraged to use traditional assessment. We compare them for us to be able to appreciate more their roles in the teaching learning process. But comparing them does not at all mean that we are preferring one from the other. They both have their respective purposes and roles in the teaching learning process. That is the end of part one. Please make sure that you're able to complete your responses in the talk engagement form. Thank you very much. I will see you in part two.